<clears throat> Thank you for coming. I'm going to try to uh, work from up here if, if I can. Understand, Chapel is uh, is uh, just <clears throat> just over, so we may have some people uh, yet uh, joining us. Uh, I left the uh, the topic in the program general. Issues, instrumental music. Obviously, that's a, a big topic, much much too big for us to to deal with. Uh, and, and we'll be doing history uh, primarily, and we'll stay uh, mostly in the uh, 1800s, prior to uh, 1906 and in the division. Um, we can fill our time easily talking about uh, uh, instances where churches divided over instrumental music. Uh, a lot of those stories are interesting stories, some humorous, nearly all tragic, however, and there, there would be benefit in that. But I think it's more important for us to look at, at the major players in the 1800s and um, and, and the arguments that are primarily used. I wasn't sure what our screen, what our background would be in here. Uh, the slides are blue. Are you able to read at all? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and, and by the way, uh, I know PowerPoint wasn't designed to be used like I use it, but I'm showing you my notes, and hopefully you can uh, follow, and, and that has some benefit me because it kind of paces me uh, as well. A little bit of background I think is always important. Um, many people are surprised that uh, controversy over instrumental music is uh, not unique to the Restoration Movement. Actually the religious bodies that were uh, closest geographically to uh, Restoration churches uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and, and beyond um, had, had a prolonged discussion in, in basically the, the generation previous to uh, the controversies in the Restoration Movement. That's the Presbyterians, the Baptist, and, and the Methodist. Actually, things like this are older than that because uh, in the 1700s, uh, New England churches, the remnants of the uh, Puritans, had hotly debated not the organ, but the bass viol. That would be the instrument that they were uh, thinking about using. Uh, from a little different perspective, the three major branches of Presbyterianism in Scotland uh, didn't really begin for sure to use the organ in worship until the late 1800s. So, um, restoration churches are not nearly as unique as a lot of people uh, seem to think. J.W. McGarvey, and, and he's prominent in our uh, story as we look at it this morning, believe that restoration churches logically last churches to experience the, uh, the conflict. Uh, he put it this way, as the disciples were set for the restoration of primitive Christianity, which was universally known to be free from the practice, they were the last religious body to think of resorting to it. And there's a great deal of truth, I think, in that. Um, Use gained ground gradually, and by the way, this would have been the same with uh, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, uh, and, and so forth. It usually uh, caught on first in the cities, then the towns, and then uh, the country. Uh, and to some extent, it caught on as, as uh, churches looked at their neighboring religious bodies and, and noticed they were doing it and they wanted uh, to be like uh, them. 
Another limiting factor was that uh, on the Midwestern frontier, I, I grew up in, in the Ozarks of Arkansas in, in the 1830s there really were primitive times. It's a little hard for me to remember sometimes that Ohio is still a frontier in, uh, in the 1830s. Uh, uh, this is more or less the center geographically of the movement. And uh, instruments weren't a factor until they were available, number one, and affordable, number two. And we'll see that uh, the first uh, instrument we know of is a melodeon, a small instrument. Uh, it would be a, a box, all right, but uh, its size would be near uh, a keyboard uh, today on a stand than, than the organs most of us would, would think about. Well, it's going to be the 1850s before instruments are affordable and available in that part of the world. So, before that time, instruments were not uh, used and not discussed uh, very much. Uh, J.S. Lamar, who was a native of uh, Georgia, uh, an editor, assistant editor under uh, Isaac Eric at the uh, Christian Standard, uh, and then a biographer of Isaac Eric, uh, and himself, of course, an enthusiastic uh, advocate of, of instruments, um, saw the adoption of instruments as, as inevitable. He said it was a consequence of growth and culture. So as, as uh, what was frontier, is it settled and, and grow and people build better houses and uh, have nicer furniture and so forth in the same way uh, the use of the instrument uh, grew. Many historians have pointed to the fact that uh, as opposed, for instance, to the controversy over uh, missionary societies, instrumental music uh, would be more divisive and I think uh, indeed that's true, although when we see uh, the divisions about 1900, uh, in, indeed both are, are factors. But we can understand that if, if I were a part of a church in, in 1860, um, whose uh, preacher was always a delegate to the missionary society in, in Cincinnati, I might or might not know much about that. On the other hand, if in my own congregation, the, the building, there was an organ, it was a physical, visible presence that I was reminded of constantly, and of course it changed the music of the church uh, uh, drastically in many ways. Just a little aside here is this with regard to uh, division over uh, instruments. Um, when the uh, Sand Creek Declaration was made, this was August 1889, in a rural area of, um, I guess I would say central Illinois, maybe uh, east central Illinois, um, Daniel Summer is not supposed to have written the document, but he preached at that event and obviously was the leader of that uh, kind of, of thought. The declaration was um, a declaration of belief, but also a declaration that uh, there was a, a division, or at least potentially a division, with the more progressive people and Essentially, the Declaration says if, if they don't turn away from those practices, abominations, they call them, we cannot and will not regard them as, as brethren. And I think most people would uh, judge that uh, the impact of the Sand Creek event in 1889 didn't have the effects that 
the uh, division of 1960 did where uh, churches of Christ were listed separately in the U.S. Uh, census. But on the other hand, there were divisions. There were churches in Illinois and Indiana the, that consciously separated from uh, uh, those churches that used the organ and did other things specified in the Sand Creek uh, Declaration. David Lipscomb was not uh, specific what this refers to it. SND North was the uh, uh, head of the uh, U.S. Census um, for the 1906 census, but for the census of that date, they're still gathering uh, materials in 1907. In fact, I think it was actually published in 1910. They had been seeing enough yearbooks, lists of preachers, and so forth, perceptive, I, I think, and they recognized, you know, this looks like there actually is a separate group, not just one group, Disciples of Christ. So he wrote to David Lipscomb, uh, editor of the Gospel Advocate, is there a separate religious body not identified with the Disciples of Christ? Lipscomb answered uh, with, with a lengthy, um, uh, specific answer, but basically said there is a distinct people. Uh, interesting phrase he's used, so uh, Dr. Hooper picked up on that and, and he, he wrote a book for covering the period, Distinct uh, People. There is a distinct people taking the Word of God as their own insufficient rule of faith and, and practice. He didn't specify um, we, we don't uh, participate in missionary societies, we don't use the instrument, but he, he does uh, refer to uh, we use the Word of God as a sufficient rule of, of faith and, and practice. And indeed, whether it be 1889 or 1906, uh, the instrument and the missionary society were very obviously a part of, of those uh, divisions. In Tennessee, where the progressives came relatively late, they were working hard from about 1880 on and, and with a measure of success. And I personally think that it was important, significant, because a part of that success was right at home, right across the river, the Cumberland River from downtown uh, Nashville. Uh, David Lipscomb himself had, uh, had evangelized uh, a neighborhood there, had converted people, had gathered a church. Uh, I think it was a little bit later, I believe the story is, he paid for all the brick. They built a brick building, he paid for the brick, and, and then was, was not there at a later time, but his friend and co-editor of the Advocate, uh, E.G. Sewell, preached there later and, and helped grow the church a, a good bit. I believe the story is Brother Sewell was also an elder there. Well, that's a concrete situation. Um, in, Frank, in fact, I think um, the effect of that being close to home probably helped David Lipscomb make his decision to say to the census, yes, we are a distinct people. We'll give you the numbers and you count us separately. Uh, early discussion and uh, adoption as early as 1849, uh, J.M. Mathis in the Christian, Pine, uh, Christian record was uh, asked uh, if uh, instrumental music would, would be acceptable. He gave a simple answer, Christians were told to sing and make melody in their hearts and, and basically uh, left it at, at that. A couple of years later, uh, the writer pushed a little harder on J.B. Henschel, uh, ecclesiastical reformer. He 
He'll identify himself as, as W. But he had been thinking about it as you can uh, see. What say you instrumental music? Should not the Christian church have organs or hear our bass vials uh, again? That the great object of psalmody might be consummated. And then notice, uh, he says, I think it's high tide, we paid attention to the subject. And in particular, we are far in the rear of Protestants on the subject of, of church music. Anytime I study any period of, um, of the history with regard to use or non-use of, of instruments, there are always people who are greatly influenced by the fact that our neighbors had it. It would be more fashionable if we had it as well. I probably could have uh, brought together uh, more from Alexander Campbell, uh, but as far as I can tell, Campbell uh, did not view it as, as a real issue, and at the time it became an issue that could not be ignored. I think we're at the time that Brother Campbell uh, didn't have all of his mental faculties like he had, had earlier. Tolliver Fanning from Nashville went to visit him on a matter uh, about that time, said there were two Campbells. The old Campbell was there, and then um, the next moment, uh, the new Campbell was there. And there were two very different people. Um, probably the onset of, of dementia, we would say today. He responded after saying some things on both sides in 1851 as kind of a conclusion, but to all spiritually minded Christians, such age, age would be as a, cow, a cowbell at a concert. In 1860, um, Dr. L.L. L. Pinkerton, um, by the way, when they went by doctor in this time, it usually meant that they were either a dentist or a physician, I forget which he was, Midway, Kentucky, uh, North Central uh, Kentucky. He saw something in the American Christian Review from Ben Franklin, and he took it personally, saw it in disparaging language uh, about a preacher and, and a church, and was just sure that Franklin was talking about him and, and so wrote it uh, angrily. Uh, I don't know whether Franklin was actually talking about him or not, but uh, uh, Franklin was concerned enough about it that he did apologize to him whether he was a writer or not. But in, in um, Pinkerton's uh, letter to the American Christian Review, uh, he admits, so far as known to me, I'm the only preacher in Kentucky of our brotherhood who has publicly advocated the propriety of employing instrumental music in some churches, and that the church in Mid uh, Midway, his church, is the only church that has yet made a decided effort to introduce it. Okay, this is early 1860, I think actually January. Uh, he says, we're doing it. So likely he is saying we've been doing it in 1859, could be even earlier than, than that. Um, their justification, our singing in Midway was so bad that it would scare even the rats from, from the worship. One of the things they did to remedy the practice was to practice it. Actually, as a boy, I remember my little home church uh, practicing singing at other times during the, the week in, in someone's home. That sounds like what they were doing. Um, after a little while, someone with a melodeon uh, brought it in to provide pitch. And then it was very long after that that uh, a sister was accompanying practice with the Melodian, and it wasn't very long after that that uh, uh, they brought her into to worship. Step back uh, two or three years um, 
to something that's said, not, not done, but uh, this figure, W.K. Pendleton, is important. Uh, Alexander Campbell's son-in-law, in, in fact, twice. He lost his first lot of wife and then married another daughter of, of Campbell's. Um, but an associate uh, editor with Campbell of the uh, Millennial Harbinger, and then by 1864, uh, Campbell had turned it over to him. He, he was uh, the, the editor. He is asked in 1857 if it was according to scripture to uh, have an organ as the queerest put this to assist in, in church music. Um, and he's saying there, and I think this remarkable early on 1857, this issue, the question you raise will not be settled by scriptural authority. There will be other factors to, to determine. General principles, the light of experience, um, for instance, if it served to promote the spirit of devotion, then the answer would be yes. Uh, on the other hand, if it interfered with the melody of the heart, then the answer would, would be no. In 1861, Isaac Eretz, already a, a prominent preacher as, as a young man, uh, first in Pittsburgh, then Eastern Ohio, later in the Detroit area, in 1866 would become uh, editor of the Christian Standard. The Christian Standard would become um, probably the most prominent uh, paper uh, in the Brotherhood uh, over time. Uh, at this time, he's still an associate editor or contributing editor to the Harbinger. And he writes an article at this time, and I don't think I noted, but he also wrote one in 1866. Um, ultimately, his important articles will come 1870 and afterward and they will be in the Christian standard. Um, but he did decide to write um, earlier. Um, I think later he may have decided that they would forgotten what I wrote. So uh, he was silent for a while but then made his voice heard finally uh, after 1870. But know what he says in, in uh, 18. 61. Um, and he generally, I'm hard on, on Eric, so uh, forgive me, but he was a good politician, a good tactician, and uh, I've read enough of his articles to know that he tends to write on both sides, so people uh, wonder what, what is he saying, which side is he actually uh, taking. Uh, first, he would say, New Testament knows nothing of instruments. And then on the other hand, some people say, uh, if you're going to argue that way, then that would even take away our songbooks. Notebooks, by the way, uh, refer to what we know as hymn books that have a musical staff and musical notation in them, not just lyrics. I think all of Campbell's hymn books simply have the lyrics. In this article, he goes on to say the only way to stop choirs and organs <coughs> and so forth is train the church well in vocal music. And then he makes the proclamation the Church of Christ has a right to good, good music. And I, I know here that, that this is typical um, of him. Um, if you think I'm unkind, then you can read for yourself uh, sometime, but I think you'll find that I'm at least right in, in saying he, he does equivocate uh, a lot and it's hard to, and some of the same could be said for uh, W.K. Pendleton. Moses Large never, never worried about what he meant he was playing. Um, 
two blood problem. The day on which a church sets up an organ in its house is the day on which it reaches the first station on the way to depositing. Did Christ ever appoint it? Did the apostles ever sanction it? Uh, any one of the primitive churches ever used it? The answer to all three of those, no, never. Uh, who would introduce it in a church? Would it, it would be someone who's the insulter of the authority of, of Christ. What should be done about it? Uh, well, first of all, no preacher should enter a building that had the organ in it. Um, no member uh, should uh, take a letter that when, when you left, you moved, um, left the congregation, you, you asked for a letter to take uh, to the church you united with. He said uh, no one who takes a letter should ever uh, be a part of a new church that uses an organ. It would be better to just stay out of church, be out, um, live out of church, as he puts it. Uh, how to do it? Uh, you remonstrate uh, in gentle kind and decided terms. If they don't heed it, then uh, even without the formality of, of a letter, uh, leave that to church. That's the only way that these organ grinding churches, over time at least, will, will be broken down and the sooner uh, the better. Okay, two people that uh, carry on an exchange in the uh, Millennial Harbinger uh, in eight, well, it begins in November of 1864, includes most of 65, and then it will pick up again in. Uh, 1868. Uh, J.W. McGarvey had uh, written, he was a graduate of Bethany College, uh, went back home to Missouri to preach for a time, was called to the uh, Main Street Church in Lexington, uh, Kentucky, just about the time the Civil War uh, began. Later on, he would head to the College of the Bible. I find it interesting that, that I know one person who was getting something done during the Civil War. He wrote uh, his commentary on Acts that most all of us know something about uh, the original edition, at least during that time. Uh, the church, and I think his very house was right on Main Street, and he saw at least one of the armies during the war march right in front of his House. He could walk right out to the, the street. Uh, there were distractions during that period for sure. The church had to give up its building to be a military hospital and had to rent to another place. So the Garvey felt some of the war all right, but still was getting that commentary done. The other person is A.S. Hayden from Ohio. He and his older brother were two of the converts of Walter Scott in the period 1827 to 1830 when he was preaching in the Mahoning uh, area of eastern, northeastern Ohio. And that's where he began to use the five-finger sermons. Most of us know what that uh, uh, means. He was later president of what uh, we would come to know as Hiram College in Hiram, Ohio. In fact, he was president until James A. Garvey, President Garvey, uh, succeeded him in 1858. It'll be obvious that Hayden believed in expediency, but not to uh, Garvey. Okay, it all begins with an eight, uh, November 1864 article. Uh, McGarvey knew the arguments. In fact, uh, you can tell from, from his article, um, he, he was aware that churches are, are beginning to um, bring the organ in without much thought, without any reason to or reason not to. And he's basically saying in this first article, we need to answer the basic question rather than just 
kind of going with our uh, feelings. Uh, he knew the reasoning that was already out there that uh, since instruments were used in the Old Testament worship and since the book of Revelation pictures uh, angels in heaven having harps of gold, um, generally the argument was it should be prohibited on, on earth. Garvey begins by saying, be careful. Assumptions may bring things that uh, we're not uh, comfortable with. And in particular, he says, silence that does not exclude the Old Testament or heavenly instruments can bring in things like burning incense, wearing priestly robes, so on and so forth. So, we decide that the guiding principle is New Testament authority. And he makes that uh, proclamation. We lay it down as an indisp uh, indisputable proposition. He also points to something that we'll, we'll come back to later. There are dispensations, after all, and each dispensation will have uh, particular requirements we can't know uh, except by express statements. Okay, on this ground, he excluded uh, incense, lighting candles, candles, wearing priestly robes, and also instrumental music. Just a quick note, McGarvey supported missionary societies, so I believe it's this first article where he goes out of his way to say, now what's said about the silence of scriptures with reference to colleges, societies, and so forth is, is wide uh, of, of the mark. And he argued here, there may be things not mentioned in the New Testament that one would employ in preaching the gospel. Um, but I'm talking about acts of worship uh, in, in the church that are authorized in the New Testament. He also acknowledged that uh, some advocates, he called them more sharp than logical, attempted to reduce this argument to absurdity by saying, if I avoid the instrument, then uh, I avoid the songbook, the tuning fork, and, and lots of other things. I've forgotten all of it the things that I have uh, seen. Church buildings were often included in the argument. I think I remember one um, argument that uh, that would take away our pews um, as, as well. His argument was the right to sing implies the propriety of everything that uh, aids in that uh, singing, you need notes, the scale, some standard of sound, and so forth. An instrument, on the other hand, uh, controls all of that. I basically suggested in the beginning that what's done in, in this period actually gives us a clue of what's uh, done in a later time in, in the Harlem. In 1923, the Boswell debate uh, argued, uh, and this is often quoted, the tuning fork has enough respect for God to stop when the singing starts. And of course, he was answering the same kind of, of argument. Yeah, I'm sorry, I keep going backwards rather than. Okay, he didn't actually uh, primarily attack uh, McGarvey's conclusion based on uh, silence. He said it's not silence that is the, the key factor, um, but it's the fact that these things, uh, the Old Testament things, were the uh, things that were decayed, waxed old, and ready uh, to vanish away. Instrumental music, he said, is a different class. 
wasn't ordained in the law by Moses. Moses was silent, but about it wasn't incorporated into the uh, ancient uh, institution. McGarvey says if that's uh, so, then uh, what the Jews were doing when they used them was, was actually will worship. They didn't have any authorization anywhere. Surely, Brother Hayden, yours is a two-edged sword and its backstrokes are the most fatal. Okay, McGarvey actually is chiding uh, Hayden a little bit here. Hayden's about 15, 16 years older, uh, would have known the Christian Baptist, um, probably had heard about Campbell's sermon on, on the law. So he, more than McGarvey, I think McGarvey is saying, you should understand dispensations, and you're ignoring that in, in your argument. Okay, another, uh, this might be a minor thing, but as I work through all of these things, one of the things I notice is that they're very careful to tell the readers, but understand that Brother Hayden actually doesn't uh, support the use of the instrument. He's just arguing about uh, uh, Garvey's faulty uh, logic. But uh, Pendleton, as editor, will, uh, will add this note. This sort of thing occurs more than once. It doesn't work, by the way. No note is added to, uh, to save Garvey from embarrassment, but uh, it always goes the other way. Okay, in the, in the second article from Hayden, he quickly moves on to prudential grounds. He's afraid that uh, what McGarvey is saying will, will create a vast and fearful consequences to the peace and, and prosperity of, of the church. So where should all of this fall? Well, this would be one of those subordinate regulations to be managed by the good sense of the brethren. Then, three years later, uh, Hayden comes back with an article, Expediency and Progress. Take note of both, both those words, expediency. We realize he was there uh, before now, but he puts it plainly in, in the title of, of an article in, in Progress. Christianity has uh, two qualities. It's marvelously flexible. And it's uh, also, on the other hand, hands has rigid, rigid inflexibility. Uh, after they have, uh, well, uh, I'll try quickly here. Basically, what he is is uh, talking about is okay. Stone Campbell, uh, Walter Scott, they were successful in reimplanting primitive Christianity here in our time. But that was back in the 20s and the 30s and so forth. This is now the 1860s, the present, and that requires something new. So uh, expediency will be the way that, that we deal uh, with that. McGarvey would finally, in his aspiration, ask, if your religion is thus flexible, why must it all the time bend toward those corrupt parties who invented and have hitherto exclusively used the organ, yet remain as stiff as a crowbar against your own brethren who oppose them? This comes, I think, just as a brief note, very late in 1868 from um, McGarvey's brother-in-law, but he gets right to, to the the point, and he may be talking more about Pendleton's expediency than even Hayden's expediency. The use of the, instru of the instrumental music has no more to, to defend it than sprinkling or the mortar's bench. If we're to have organs and melodiums, then let us have everything else that will work well. That's what expediency actually is. And expediency 
won't impede us in any way.
I'm keeping you long, but uh, I think we have gone far enough to, uh, to and I could go through others who, who were simply saying the, the authority of Scripture is what we have to go by. But I think we have gotten a taste for uh, the arguments. Basically, they fall into the category of um, the instruments have to be authorized by, by Scripture uh, to be admissible. And then in various ways on the other side, all of the arguments run to expediency. It's, it's the sort of thing that the brethren can decide in love. And uh, if they can do that, then uh, it, it's admissible. Well, I've run along. I thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, 